Hello, Chem 2. Uh, today we're going to go over Section 3 of Chapter 11. Um, and there's an intent, intentional reason why this nerdy guy in the corner is here. Um, today's PowerPoint and maybe tomorrow's PowerPoint, depending on whether I get done tonight or today, are going to be two of the more mathy PowerPoints that we're going to have and some of the more complex concepts mathematically we're going to have. We're also going to introduce a, a concept that is found in Algebra 2 that I'm going to give you the quick Reader's Digest version on how to use it as far as a, a button on your calculator. But the reality is um, this stuff is going to be a little complicated. So um, buckle up. It's going to be a little bit of, of a bumpy ride when it comes to the mathematics. So administrative is issues, Chapter 8 still laying out there. Um, some of you guys are having some issues with the exam. I'm just going to say nicely because I've gotten like two or three emails today. Um, please, at least attempt the entire exam before asking questions. Okay, You're given five chances at this test. Five. Um, it's tough to know which questions you can get right or wrong if you're going to do two questions and then decide, hey, I'm going to go ahead and ask a question because number three is kind of tough um, and not do anything else. So attempt the entire test. That also gives me a chance to go in from my end on the owl and see how your answer responds to what's expected. If you don't submit an answer, I have no idea. Even if you show me your work, I don't know what question you are actually answering and I don't know a question, what um, answer they were actually re expecting. Um, that mostly revolves around sig figs indicating whether sig figs really do make a difference in whether you have the answer right or wrong. So attempt the entire test before asking any questions. Um, there's the optional out for chapter 11. There's the required out for chapter 11. And then there's the chapter 11 exam will be there. Um, I think I have it popping up later on this week. I may bump that um, a little bit because we're not going to finish this chapter this week. But you must get 75% on the required out in order to be allowed to take the test. So this is chapter 11. We're going to do section three right now. Uh, section three is reactant concentration versus time. Reaction concentration versus time. So in ninth grade, you, you were introduced to this concept of half-life. So in ninth grade, um, you were given the idea of half-life, saying that if you had some sodium, which decomposed, and you started off with 0.1 grams and after 29.8 hours you had 0 0.025 milligrams sorry both were milligrams um what's the half-life well in chem one um or even in physics one if you discussed half-life in there which you may have um you realize that in order for one half-life to go by 0.1 in one half-life would become 0 0.05 and then in another half-life would become 0.0 0.025. So actually, the 29.8 hours is two half lives. So you would divide that half life at time by two to get the half life. Now, in Chem 1, when we discussed half life, uh, it revolved mostly around atoms and their decay. Um, we also kept things pretty simple in exact amounts of half life. Well, what we're going to do today is look at different types of reactions that aren't as clean but also look at reactions that, that don't have very specific time frames associated with the half-life. You'll see what I mean in a second. So here's an example. Later on in this PowerPoint, we're going to have an example problem that says if I start with 0 0.50 milligrams, and after 23.2 hours, I have 0 0.017 milligrams left, what's the half-life? Well, I, didn't, I got rid of more than a half, but I got rid of more than... Um, less than a quarter. So uh, there's no real easy way, Chem 1 wise, to be able to figure out what that half life is. Hopefully, by the end of this PowerPoint, you'll know how to do that. So, one of the reasons that there's an issue here is that if you look at a concentration versus time graph, and this one happens to be one for a first order reaction, it's not a straight line. You have a relationship where, say, for instance, this one I made up just to, and I put in some numbers to get it to make it make sense. So, this is a forced. Um, use of the uh, great laws I'm going to use in a second. If I start off with a one molar solution at point time zero, you'll notice that at the um, five hour mark, 
half of it has gone away. So at the half at five hours, I'm down to half. And after another five hours, I'm down to a quarter of it. And after another five hours, I'm down to an eighth of it. And after finally another five hours, I'm down to a sixteenth. Well, what happens, what that means is the half-life of this material is going to be um, five hours. Half of whatever's left over went away in five hours. Now, you'll notice the line's not straight. It curves. It has a what's called a logarithmic scale. Those of you who are already taking Algebra 2 understand what a logarithm is or may understand in the concept of a logarithm, but this is a logarithmic scale. The rate at which it changes is dependent on the amount of material. We know that because for first order reactions, we know that it's going to have, as the concentration changes, um, the rate is going to change at the same rate. So as there's less and less material, the rate is going to become less and less and less. However, in this situation, after every five hours, half of whatever you started with is remaining. Okay, so what we're going to be looking at are what we call integrated rate law equations or integrated rate equations, where they're going to show a mathematical relationship between the amount or the concentration and the time that has, has passed. So we're going to see this, for instance, this is a graph of an integrated rate law equation. I use the integrated rate law equation in order to come up with this graph in Excel. Um, but this is very, very typical of what a first order concentration versus time graph would look like. So for first order reactions, if A becomes products, I don't care what it is. And actually what we're going to do to, to simplify things dramatically in this um, section is we're only going to worry about reactions that have one reactant. We're only going to worry about reactant, reactions that have only one reactant and see what order it is with respect to that one reactant. You can only imagine how complicated these graphs would get, or how complicated these expressions would get if there were multiple reactants. And, and that's that's not even AP, that's that's college. So we're going to just worry about just single order reactions. First one we're looking at is first order. Now, hold on. The mathematical relationship is that the concentration of time relationship is logarithmic. LN is the natural logarithm. Now, I do know some of you guys are totally freaking out because you either haven't had Algebra 2 yet or you're currently in Algebra 2 and your teacher hasn't gotten to it yet because of this whole coronavirus craziness. Sorry, I'll just calm down. We're going to give you a simplified version of what a logarithm is in a second. But this is the mathematical relationship. You'll notice that the logarithm... The natural logarithm, Ln means natural logarithm. The natural logarithm of A0 compared to A. Now, what are those? Well, A0 is the concentration at the beginning, A times zero, a concentration at time zero. And A is a concentration at any given time. So A0 over A, A0 over A is going to be equal to K, that's that rate law concept, times the time. Okay. Another way to look at it, which is the way that I like to look at it a lot better, is the, the natural log of A, whatever the concentration is at a given moment in time, is going to be equal to the natural logarithm of the initial concentration minus the, con the K, the equilibrium constant, sorry, the rate law constant times the time. This, the, you'll see in a minute why I like this expression. Now let's talk a little bit about logarithms. I know it's a little little funky. I know that it's an expression that maybe, just maybe, you haven't had a chance to deal with. And if you have, you've taken Algebra 2 already, um, just see whether or not I, I, I explain this in probably the simplest way possible. So a logarithm is just a way of looking at exponents. So let's think about it. Addition and subtraction are opposites of one another. If you want to undo an addition, you're going to subtract. If you want to undo a subtraction, you're going to add. Multiplication and division are opposites of one another. If you want to undo a multiplication, you're going to divide. You've all done that with your calculator. You accidentally typed in um, times two, and you're, oh, fart. I got to get back to my original answer, and you divide by two to get back to your original answer. They're opposite functions. Well, logarithms are the opposite functions to the exponent. They're raising something to a power. So if I were to ask you, I would ask you to say, what, what, 10 raised to what power is 10,000? 10 raised to what power is 10,000? I'm actually asking what a logarithm is, okay? 
I'm asking you, so if I go back in my memory banks, I say, well, 10 to the fourth power, 10 to the fourth power, see where I moved the decimal to over one, two, three, four places, 10 to the fourth power, power is 10,000. That means, and this is the description here, that the log base 10, L-O-G is normally reserved. If you don't see a base here, it's base 10. The log base 10 of 10,000 is 4. It's just, it's the opposite function. If I want to know 10 raised to what power is 10,000, then you're going to take the logarithm. Logarithm of 10,000 is 4. Now, what do I want you to be able to do? I want you to be able to use your calculator. If you punch into your calculator, log, there should be a button in your calculator labeled log, L-O-G, L-O-G, 10,000, hit e your equal or your enter, whatever the button it is, it's going to give you the value of 4. And you can get the logarithm of any value. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a number. It's the opposite. Now, you can get logarithms of non-exact numbers. Log of 75 will give you a number. Log of 22 will give you a number. They're going to give you, give you a number. And if you use the log button, L-O-G button on your calculator, you're going to get log base 10. However, you are notice from the example that I gave, there was L-N. Well, natural logs, or LN, are based on the, on the value of a number called E, or a number that's given the designation of E. I am not going to get into the weirdness of E. E is a super, super special number. Um, I can spend a little bit of time, but we don't have a time here. But E is a very special, special, special number. Almost, almost as special. In some cases, we'll argue more special than pi. But E's value is, a, again, a um, repeating, not a repeating number. It's a... It's a um, Irrational number is 2.71828, or it's E on your calculator. You have a cal calculator that has a value of E. You might have an E to the X button. And what's going to happen is natural log of Y is equal to X is the same as saying E. Notice instead of taking the 10 raised to that number, we use E raised to that number. E raised to X is Y. So we're going to be able to go back and forth, and I'm going to use these, these examples. Very often, they're going to ask you, what's Y? And you're going to calculate what this X value is, and you're literally going to punch in your calculator E raised to the whatever value you, you had gets there. Now, you do not have to remember this number. Again, your calculator has an E button. If you, I asked you at the beginning of the year to get a calculator with an a exponent and a um, scientific calculator, it has an E button on it. Um, and you'll be able to do this without having to memorize the, the whole drawn out number of what E is. So let's go back to this. So for first order reactions, there is a mathematical relationship between the concentration at any given moment in time as it compares to three things. The, the original concentration, the rate law constant, just like we did in the K for our normal rate laws, and the time, the time that's been elapsed. So if I want to graph this, data, if I were to graph the data, and instead of graphing the concentration like I did on the original example, I graphed the natural log of the concentration, then I'm going to get a straight line. Because I don't know whether you can see this, it's hard to hard to imagine. I probably should have put a little bit extra here, but this is in a y equals mx plus b format. y, natural log of a, equals mx negative kt, because if you look at our graph, time is on the x-axis and natural log of concentration is on the y-axis. Um, so negative kt, negative kt is, is um, mx plus b. b is the natural log of a naught, initial concentration. In this situation, if we were taking to take 10 raised to the negative was at 1.8 we would get the initial concentration, or sorry, E raised to the negative 1.8, we would get the initial concentration of this sample. But you're going to get a straight line if you were to graph natural log of the concentration versus the time. And this is the equation that represents that straight line. So how would we use this? Well, let's look at an example. I guess that's the best way to do this. Let's look at an example. So consider you have a first order decomposition of dinitrogen uh, pentoxide like we had in the previous graph. And you know that at 67 degrees Celsius, the K value is 0.35 um, per minutes. There is no concentration because there's, it's first order, so it's per minutes. And it asks, what would the concentration be after six minutes if you started at 0.200 molar? 
So things I have, I have the K value, I have the time, I have the initial concentration, and I know there's a first order reaction that's very, very important before we finish up this whole PowerPoint, worry about whether or not it's first order. So here's the two equations we have, and you could use either one. I like to use the one on the right. I think it's a little bit easier to use the one on the right, in my opinion. But if you're comfortable with logarithms at all, you can use the one on the left. So what I have to do is I have to substitute into those equations. Either one, either one works. My initial concentration, my concentration that I'm looking for. Okay, remember, we're looking at um, what's the concentration going to be. So I have to figure out what that concentration is. This is my X, n 5 concentration, this is my X. Um, I know my K, I know my T. So this is the the number that I'm looking for. This is my X. So I'm going to go ahead and put it into the equation. I'm going to put it in the second one. And I say natural log of 2, of sorry, natural log of 0.2 minus the natural log of uh, the number of the X I'm looking for is going to equal to KT. Well, if I do the natural log of 0.2, I get negative 1.609 right, right around the calculator. I get the natural log of this, I, that's what I'm looking for. My K was 0.35, and my time was six minutes. So I do my math, and I move everything to the other side. So I take this natural log of um, N205, add it to both sides. So now it's on the left-hand side. I have my negative 1.6. And I'm going to subtract what this value was. This value was um, negative um, 2.1. I'm going I'm to subtract that from both sides. I get that this sum here is negative 3.7. So I know that the natural log of N205 at time for six minutes is um, negative 3.7. I need to go backwards. And I said going backwards means taking e to that number is it goes going backwards. And I find that at concentration at um, six minutes is going to be 0.024. So you're, you're literally using one of the equations and then plugging the numbers in, going back as far as you can until you get to X, and then solving for what X is. Try another one. Same, same scenario. Now it's going to ask you, well, how long would it take for the concentration to drop from the 0.2 that we began with in the last example only down to 0.150? How much time would that take? So now, instead of solving for the concentration, we're solving for the time. Still going to look through the same same equations. Now I have the initial concentration. I have the concentration that I'm looking at at time at moment time, and I still have my k. So I know that it's going to be one of those guys. So I'm going to use one of those equations. I'm going to go ahead and use the second one again. So natural log of 0.2 minus natural log of 0.5 is equal to 0.35 times t. This one seems a lot easier. Natural log of 0.2, we already said it was negative 1.61. I got that right out of my calculator. Natural log of 0.15, that again is um, negative 1.9. Got that right out of my calculator. Negative 1.6 minus a minus 1.9 is equal to, again, 0.35 times t. So T happens to be 0.82 minutes. So it's only going to take less than a minute for the concentration to drop from 0.2 down to 0.15. Okay, let's try another one. Now, how and this is going to lead into a half-life concept that I introduced the lesson on. How long does it take for half of the sample to go away? How long does it take for half of the sample to go away? They're really asking you, what is the half-life of this reaction? Um, they're not giving you initial concentration because you guys should know the initial the half-life um, in this situation does not depend on the initial concentration. You'll see with the other um, types of rates that it does. But for this one, it doesn't depend on how much you have. The half-life is going to be the half-life. So you have the K. And here's where it gets kind of sneaky. Concentration of N205 at time T that you're asking for is going to be half of that of the initial concentration, hence the concept of half-life. So I pick one to substitute it into. Um, I'm actually for this one going to make it a little bit easier. I'm going to substitute into the first one. So I have an initial concentration, and in the denominator I have one half the initial concentration. My initial concentrations um, cancel, 
I'm left with natural log of 1 over 1 half, or the natural log of 2, is equal to k.35 times t. So if I want to find out what the constant, the time is, I'm going to take the natural log of 2, which is 0 0.693, and divide it by 0 0.35, and I find that it took 2 minutes for this reaction to come to half-life. The half-life of this reaction is 2 minutes. So the concept of half-life, when you're talking about a first-order reaction, the half-life reaction, the half-life equation is going to be, half-life is going to be the natural log of 2 over whatever k is. The half-life is dependent on the k. It is not dependent on the initial concentration. It's not dependent on anything other than the k value. So natural log of 2 divided by whatever the k value is, that rate law constant that we figured out from the previous um, PowerPoint is going to be the half-life. And they show down here some other examples of where that k comes from. That k is the k from the rate law constant. Okay, so that's first order reactions and here's a graph showing you the half-life of different fractions going away and seeing how much goes away over time and how much shows up. Okay, so let's go back to that original example. The decomposition of uh, 24, sodium 24 starting at 0.05 at 23.2 hours at 0.017 milligrams left over what's the half-life so what do I have I have these equations I have the half-life equation I have my rate law equations and I have my initial concentration 0.5 and my um, time constant time 23.2 uh, I have the value there so I'm going to use the equation um, of natural log of a naught over a and find out what my k is. Okay, so I have my a naught, my concentration at the beginning is 0 0.0105, my concentration at the end is 0 0.1075, 0 0.017 mumbles, and my time was 23.2 minutes. So I'm going to solve for my k and find out my k is 0 0.0. Four, six, five. That's my k value. Then I'm going to use my k value in my half-life equation and plug it right in. So my half-life equation is 0.693 divided by the k value, and I find that my half-life of this reaction is 14.9 hours. If you go back to the original example I used in the beginning, that was the time, the half-life of the reaction that I shared with the ninth grade example. Okay, so that's all for first order and again the comp the equations are really kind of complicated um, don't get too overwhelmed just you're going to need to know those equations i've intentionally on all these powerpoints highlighted the the important equations in yellow so maybe you can go back and write those down so you know exactly which equations you may or may not be using but now we're going to go into what about the other orders so this is the equations used for first order. What if we had a zeroth order reaction? Well, those equations look just a little bit different. So if we have rate equals K times the concentration raised to the zero power, that just means if it's zeroth order that the rate is equal to the K value. The rate is equal to the K value. A way to look at that is look at the concentration. The concentration is going to change, um, is going to be dependent only on what the initial concentration was, and then the time and the k value. So this second equation is the integrated rate equation for a zeroth order reaction. Notice that instead of using natural logs of concentration in the expression, it looks exactly the same, except it's using just the concentrations. And that's because the decay of a zeroth order reaction is not going to be um, logarithmic, it's going to be a linear expression. Again, this is a linear equation. Y, concentration of A, mx, negative k times t, x would be the, uh, x would be the time, um, and then your uh, intercept would actually be your initial concentration. For second order reactions, they are a little weirder. Um, and I'm not going to go into the calculus involved to explain why this is, but we're just going to suffice to say that the equation looks very, very similar. But instead of talking about 
um, log natural logarithms. We're talking about concentrations. We're talking about the inverse of concentrations. One over the inverse of a minus one over the inverse of a naught is equal to kt. So what we have here are three equations. So this is a really, really important table that um, under normal circumstances, I would give you um, everything but the last column, everything but the last column on the test. Under normal circumstances, I would give you this, this table of what does the rate law look like, what is the concentration versus time equation. And you'll notice I've changed some of them a little bit because I like this format a little bit better. And then the half-life equations, okay? And what you need to be able to do is use them. So if you wanted to print out this particular slide from this PowerPoint to be able to use it on the homeworks associated with this, this would not be a, a bad idea because these equations are the ones you're going to go back and forth between. But those are the equations. And you'll notice they're slightly different. Now let me bring something to your attention. For a zeroth order equation, it uses concentration. That means if I were to plot a concentration graph of concentration versus time, where time is on the x-axis and concentration is on the y-axis, I would get a straight line. Natural, log, natural logs are used with the first order. So if I were to graph time on the x-axis and natural log of concentration on the y-axis, I would get a straight line. And finally, you'll notice the format of the last one changed a little bit from the last slide, but it uses inverse concentrations. If I were to graph the time on the x-axis and inverse concentration on the y-axis, I would get a straight line. So here they are. Here's zero with order graphs. Concentration versus time, logarithm versus time, inverse concentration versus time. You'll notice one of the three is going to be a straight line. And here's the even more, uh, more um, helpful twist. Whatever the slope is of that straight line, that is your k value. I'm going to say that again. Whatever the slope is of that line, that is your k value, but it's the negative of your k value. So you'll notice you have a negative slope, but your k value is going to be positive. Same thing with the first order. You'll notice the concentration versus time. We showed that graph before. It's logarithmic. But the logarithm graph is a straight line, and the one over concentration graph is not. So, again, that straight line being of the concentration versus time graph, concentration versus time graph, sorry, natural logarithm of concentration versus time graph being a straight line tells us that this is a first order reaction. So I take the slope, take the negative of it, and I find that's my k value. And then finally, if I take a second order graph, second order reaction, and I graph concentration versus time, uh, it's even more aggressively logarithmic. A logarithm versus time, that even has a logarithm appeal to it. And then you have the one over concentration. Time is a straight line. That one, since it's a positive slope, it is a positive straight up. The slope is the K. So let's, to summarize, let's summarize that if the integrated rate law is um, in the format of concentrations, then the concentration versus time graph is going to be a straight line. If it's used logarithms, logarithms, then the logarithm versus time graph is going to be a straight line. And if it's um, second order, then if your con inverse concentrations versus time graph is going to give you a straight line. I can graph, and this is what we'll do if you come to AP, um, I can graph the concentration of a reaction over time and determine, based on which one of these three graphs is linear, whether the reaction is a zero, a first order, or a second order reaction. So let's see how you would use this. The following data was, was obtained from a gas phase cut decomposition of hydrogen and iodide. And there's my times, and there's my concentrations. Is the reaction first, zero, or second order? I know I read them in the wrong order. Is the reaction zeroth order, first order, or second order with respect to hydrogen and iodide? So I need to first prepare a table with the data. I need to change those concentrations into concentrations, into um, natural logarithms and into inverses, and then see which one of those graphs generates a linear plot. <clears throat> so here's my times. Here's my concentrations from the previous graph. 
Here's me getting my numbers off of a handy dandy calculator. The natural log of 0.5, the natural log of 0.33, the natural log of 0.25, dot, dot, dot. There we go. And then here's my inverses. 1 over 1, 1 over 0.5, 1 over 0.33, 1 over 0.25, 1, 2, 3, 4. And you can kind of see where this is leading, but humor me. So if I graph these, I get these three graphs. I get the concentration versus time graph. I get the natural log versus time graph. And I get the inverse of a time graph. And you can see very clearly that the inverse of concentration over time versus time is a straight line. So therefore, this reaction is a second order equation. Um, just as a final note, if it would have been zeroth order, then the concentration of 0.1 would have dropped to 0.5 in two hours. Um, it didn't, okay? It didn't. If the reaction was zeroth order, it would be all over in two hours. So, sorry, it would be all over in four hours. So 0.1 to 0.5, two hours. So another point, another two hours would have been gone. It wasn't. If the reaction was first order, the concentration would be 0 0.4, 0 0.25 after four hours. So it dropped in half, and then it dropped in half again, and it didn't do that. Okay. So anyway, um, you need to be able to graph the, the, the um, plots and see what you get. Whichever one tells you is linear, whichever one gives you a linear relationship is going to tell you whether the reaction is first, second, or zeroth order. Okay. So that's today's lesson on concentration versus time and the um, integrated rate laws. It's pretty complicated, especially if you haven't had algebra. Um, what's next? Well, the next one I'm going to do is going to include two sections, uh, section four and section five. Section four is very um, conceptual, talking about the two main models of reaction rates and what how do we determine what makes reactions go faster or slower? It has some math to it, but most of it is, is mostly an introduction to explain why certain things do what they do. And we won't be actually using the equations in section four. But section five is a really, is, a, is going to be a, a challenging reaction, a challenging um, section only because normally we would have done a, done a lab at this point and we have, would have done would have physically gone through the process of determining the equation that's going to be showing up in section five. So I'm going to have to introduce the equation um, without actually having you do the lab and seeing some of the results. So we're going to do the best we can. Now, on one note, I did include a example of the lab that we were going to do um, being done by a professional. Um, it's probably it's quite a few years ago. But showing the 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 uh, reaction, showing the example, and I'm going to use that as a little bit of a springboard into the next um, PowerPoint. So anyway, hopefully everybody's being safe, healthy, practicing your social distancing. Um, I hope to see you guys real soon, um, tomorrow, Tuesday, and Thursday. We will be having our flex hour from two o'clock to three. So if you'd like to come by, um, please do so. Um, you guys, everybody be safe. I will see you next time. Always remember, never forget, sig figs really do matter. Toodles.